Hello everyone, you are listening to the New Discourses podcast. My name is James Lindsay, and I welcome you to the show. I'm going to continue a little bit in my new tradition. I, maybe we'll do quite a bit of this, we'll see, here on the New Discourses podcast. A while ago, I read through Herbert Marcuse's essay, um, Repressive Tolerance, and I did that in four parts, four segments. I read the entire essay and I added my commentary as we went. I wanted to try to bring the essay to light, to clarity, to make sure that people could read it and could read along with it as I went through. And I think that that was actually a successful means of presenting woke literature directly to people. So I want to kind of continue that a little bit with some other pieces. Um, Sometimes it's a bit difficult. And in this case, I actually want to go to the forging of the one ring. The, the ring of power, one ring to rule them all, one ring to bind them. Uh, however it goes in the darkness, bind them. I don't remember the poem. So anyway, I want to show you the, the, the creation, the birthplace of Woke, the one ring, the ring of power that we are now up against, and its name is intersectionality. So I'm not going to quite, I already lied a little bit, I'm not going to quite show you the introduction of intersectionality. Intersectionality arises from a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw, in a paper that she wrote in 1989. Um, I'm going to read to you from a paper that she wrote in 1991, her most famous paper and probably the most influential paper given the direction the world has taken uh, in a very long time, maybe even since repressive tolerance. It is called Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. It was published in the Stanford Law Review in in July of 1991. and you can look it up. Uh, there are some abridged versions, at least, available online for free, and you can try to follow along. I don't want to read the whole paper. The whole paper is actually about 60 pages long. It would take us seven or eight episodes to get all the way through. I'm going to read the introduction, and I'm going to read the conclusion. Um, and I don't mean to elide over all the stuff in the middle. I don't want to just skip it. I don't want to misrepresent it. Um, it is tedious. It is case after case after case after case after case of kind of the same argument being made. Sometimes it's fairly hilarious. She actually talks about the, you know, lewd rap group Two Live Crew at one point in the middle. But it is 60 pages long in the middle part of the paper. The introduction contains some good stuff that is, I think, very illuminating, and that's where we're going to see the Ring of Power being forged. And then the end of the paper is very key to understanding what's going on. So hopefully I can do this in two episodes by leaving out all of the long, long stuff in the middle. Um, What's happening in the middle is a number of sort of something like case studies. So she goes to like a women's, uh, a battered women's shelter here and tells a story. And she looks at crime in Los Angeles and these kinds of neighborhoods and tells a story. She has a story where she fights with the Los Angeles police to try to get statistics released. And they don't want to release the statistics about violence against women in, uh, neighborhoods that are predominantly uh, black and Hispanic because they're afraid that it will lead to (laughs) discrimination and stereotyping, um, that these men are, abnormally violent. And so she says that the failure to release the statistics itself hides uh, the misogyny involved in battering women, for example. And therefore, she pins this down to an idea that uh, the black, for example, liberation politics are very male and patriarchal and misogynistic and go out of their way to hide their patriarchy and misogyny and sexism. And so the intersectionality where you're considering racism and sexism at the same time and race and sex as relevant to the problems at the same time become necessary. So it's lots of stories like that between battered women, uh, whether they, another big one she made, I just talked about the thing with the, with the LA police, um, There's another one that she spends a lot of time on where she's talking about battered women who don't speak English. And there's a case study that she brings up where, you know, they wouldn't receive this woman who was in a very bad situation. Lots of immigrant stories where different cultures won't allow, you know, reporting of the problems or they can't get enough privacy to report the problems or they go to the, in this case that I was starting to mention, they bring up a case where the, the, shelters themselves don't have the resources to be able to properly help 
the people and therefore turned them down. And so apparently intersectionality is supposed to solve all of the difficult uh, problems with immigration. And it's very clear that Kimberly Crenshaw in this paper, again, written in 1991, seems to just assume that uh, immigration, like language barriers and so on, uh, these these things there should almost just have kind of perfect solutions and infinite amounts of resources to solve them. Uh, it's I think a kind of stunning display of motivated reasoning. But we're not going to linger on the middle of the paper. I will just read the introduction and the conclusion. But I do want to point out that you know this is what's going on in the middle of the paper. Uh, I will apologize if I stumble a little bit when I read through some of the footnotes. They're in tiny tiny print and. Uh, Sometimes they're hard to see while I'm back at the mic. We'll try to make that work as best as I can. Um, but before I get started reading the paper, I want to frame up just a little bit about who Kimberly Crenshaw is. Kimberly Crenshaw is still alive. She is still an activist. She's active on Twitter. She runs the African American Policy Forum, which is funded through primarily Open Society Foundation money at present. She I believe is still affiliated with UCLA. She's been affiliated with UCLA for a number of years, but she got her degree at Harvard Law. And she was the uh, student at Harvard Law of Derrick Bell. And Derrick Bell is credited with being the uh, half of the foundation of critical race theory. Although the term was, in fact, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who wrote this paper. Kimberly Crenshaw also introduced the concept of intersectionality, which she laid out in a paper two years earlier to this one in 1989. Um, within a few years, there were being, books being written about intersectionality. By a decade or so later, intersectionality had achieved complete dominance. And I think I can kind of illustrate how and why that occurred um, by going through the introduction and conclusion of this paper. So the influence of Kimberly Crenshaw, both previously and presently, really is difficult to overstate. She's had, this is probably one of the most impactful papers when we, when we, introduce this paper in cynical theories, uh, Helen and, and I say that the idea of intersectionality and that this paper in particular was set to change the world. And I don't think for the better. I don't think contrary to some of the valuable points that, you know, very kind of simplistic or superficial intersectional thought can bring to you. I don't think the intersectionality has made the world a better place by any means. And in the second part of this, I think we'll see why when we talk about, uh, when we read the conclusion to this paper and see what she was after and what she was doing and why she was doing it. And it's right in the title, Intersectionality Identity Politics, because that's really what it's about is identity politics. And I don't think identity politics has been a good influence on the world. The third thing in the subtitle, of course, is violence against women of color. And just to make a general point, while I do occasionally see the arguments that Crenshaw is making. I think that she raises some valid points. Very frequently, I think that she's also missing very important issues like the challenges around immigration, the limitations on resources, the need to balance other concerns like that if you release those statistics uh, with the uh, violence against women in uh, certain areas that you would have, uh, you know, stereotyping about brown and black men being particularly violent. Uh, this is one of the reasons why France does not collect racial uh, racial statistics and report them. Uh, it treats people as people and not as racial categories. And that's exactly what Kimberly Crenshaw wants to reverse for the purposes of identity politics. And she is unrepentantly rooted in identity politics, uh, just to let you know. So that's sort of some background. Crenshaw, very influential. Like I said, she runs what's known as an African-American policy forum now that uh, is very well funded and um, pushes a lot of the prison abolition movement and these other uh, very radical movements that we've seen erupt in violence for the last uh, getting on nine or ten months now. Um, so Crenshaw's ideas are kind of behind that uh, in a very, very real sense. So without further ado, this episode of the New Discourses podcast, we'll read the introduction to Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color by Kimberly Crenshaw, published in 1991 in the Stanford Law Review. And I'll try to give it some color and some context as we go. Um, subsequent episode, hopefully it'll just be two, we'll do the same with the conclusion. 
So let's read through this and uh, see what we can do. So she begins, and I'm going to have to do some diverting into the footnotes pretty early on here, but she begins, over the last two decades, women have organized against the almost routine violence that shapes their lives. Okay, so I want to first start and say that this is, of course, an assertion. This is another thing we're going to hear again and again throughout this paper is argument by assertion, then backed up in the middle part that we're mostly going to skip or entirely going to skip, then backed up by a victim story so that you can't disagree with the assertion because then you would be disagreeing or erasing the plight of the victim. This is a typical tactic in critical theories is to advance through examples that are actually victimhood stories so that when you disagree with them, you can be accused uh, you can you can disagree with their assertion or their interpretation or their analysis and then be accused subsequently of um, not caring about some very uh, heart sometimes heart wrenching situation or not caring enough and so the lack of care becomes a slight against your uh, moral integrity and therefore you must somehow not be engaging fully with the full gravity especially emotional gravity of the of the argument being made or the assertion being put forth. So again, over the last two decades, and this is somewhat true, of course, women have organized against the almost routine violence that shapes their lives. Um, And she's actually talking in particular, she actually cites here, uh, Susan Brown Miller is a good example against our will is the name of the book, men, women, and rape from 1975. And a number of other people talking about these, Organiz- this organization against the routine violence. Now, I bring up Brown Miller, even though we've just started, and want to go into a diversion about Brown Miller because Brown Miller is an ext- an interesting case. Brown Miller's book Against Our Will was about rape, and obviously this paper is about violence against women. Brown Miller's book actually did solve a major problem, in my opinion, where dealing with the issue of rape comes up. The issue of rape is a very fruitful place for activist. Uh, activity, but at the same time, it's because it's a legitimately difficult problem. Due process of law has to be maintained. Due process of law that we're going to assume innocence and we are going to uh, not prosecute people who are innocent if we can avoid it at all. Uh, the old saying is better 10 men, 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man is condemned. And Rape is hard because it comes down to a he said, she said argument kind of a lot of the time. You know, solid objective evidence is very rarely available. And um, in the a case of a, in any case, the person who is accused of rape, typically going to be male in many cases because certain, there is probably a bias in this, but also the reporting is nearly always uh, women reporting men who raped them and men tend not to report when women raped them for a variety of other reasons. But it's the man and the accused, I should say, of rape always has a very strong motivation to lie, to protect himself or to distort the situation so that he's not, he's considered not guilty. Whereas the accuser is more complicated because if the accuser is telling the truth, then that's something that has to be taken very seriously. And this is where the difficulty arises uh, in a he said, she said argument, a subjective based argument. But if the accuser is falsely accusing or exaggerating the story, um, that person is also very motivated to lie. And you, so you, when you lack access to objective evidence, due process will result in many guilty parties going free. And this is, of course, an outrage and uh, ideally wouldn't be happening, but it's an outrage to, to to genuine victims. And rape presents a unique case where the crime is particularly horrific, particularly heinous, and yet notoriously difficult to prosecute adequately. And Brown Miller steps into this and writes this against our will book. So Susan Brown Miller is cited here in Crenshaw's paper, and she writes this, writes in this book, and, and very, very successfully, I think, to to much credit to her, really does damage to the the so-called victim blaming 
um, defense where, you know, well, what were you wearing and why didn't you, you know, act differently and maybe you were asking for it or whatever, these kinds of things. Before Brown Miller's book, in fact, um, many, many people who are literally engaged or were pro- genuinely engaging, I should say, in sexual misconduct up to and including rape were able to victim blame. And, and I think that the point that that's not acceptable is correct. I think Brown Miller has that argument. Now, the problem with Brown Miller's book is that Brown Miller frames this out to be that rape is all patriarchal power. It's an application of misogyny and patriarchy and sexism. And that sex, sexual desire, has nothing to do with rape. This is, of course, preposterous. And this has also created a problem because for a while, and even to the, to this day to some degree, If you can't find the power dynamics now, and if it was actually a sexually motivated rape, which certainly some of them are, in fact, many, if not most of them will be, at least in part, but if you can't find the power dynamic, you also can't prosecute if we just follow Brown Miller. So Brown Miller overreached, and this is a thing, but she also, I think, gave made an invaluable contribution. And in the ideal circumstances, this is the kind of thing that scholarship kind of should be doing. Overreaching in scholarship isn't the problem. Inability to criticize an overreach, inability to course correct after an overreach is the problem. Uh, I genu- generally think that people have mostly bad ideas with some good ones mixed in. And that goes for really smart people too. And so we have to be able to take something like Brown Miller and then very carefully analyze it and decide what has she added and what has she added that she shouldn't. You know, what here has merit and what here doesn't. And one of my problems with critical theory, and that's been vastly amplified by postmodernism, which this paper forges that ring, mixing critical theory and postmodernism explicitly, is that it's not allowed. You're not allowed to criticize part of the argument. You're not allowed to consider something that's not power dynamics. So this is a context in which Crenshaw's writing, though. The first citation in this paper is Susan Brown Miller. Um, so you can tell that she's going to be very interested in seeing everything through lenses of power and how those that, that power is played out through groups, men versus women in this case. Um, as she said, women have organized against some almost routine violence that shapes their lives. Okay, so just a little context there that, you know, scholarly and historical context. If you want to know more about Brown Miller's work and its upsides and its downsides, I do encourage you to read Alice Dreger's book, um, Galileo's middle finger. It's covered in rather tremendously clear, good detail there. Um, This isn't shilling for a friend. I don't think Dreger likes me anymore. So uh, as many people don't. So um, you can go ahead and check that out if you want more on Susan Brown Miller and her relevance. It's a a good summary. Uh, So anyway, picking back up with Crenshaw, I'm going to start again. It's only one sentence, and then I'm going to just go ahead and continue through the paragraph. Over the last two decades, Crenshaw writes, women have organized against the almost routine violence that shapes their lives. Drawing from the strength of shared experience, women have recognized that the political demands of millions speak more powerfully than the pleas of a few isolated voices. Did you catch the shared experience thing? So shared experience. So now this is that call toward group thinking, toward, toward group identification. Uh, realizing that there's strength in group identification. That's why identity politics is core to this paper. So this is unapologetically leaning into identity politics to say there's strength in shared experience. And that leads women to what? To recognize that the political demands of millions speak more powerfully than the pleas of a few isolated voices. So if a few women are saying, here's bad things that happen to women, that doesn't move a lot. But if the women can gather together and say, this is a patriarchal system. So now we're going to move into systemic thinking. This is a patriarchal system that affects misogyny, as Kate Mann has it in her book, Down Girl, that is also a system. She says it's the enforcer of patriarchy. Now you can can create a coalition of millions that can speak much more powerfully as a political block. In other words, you can turn an identity into a political block, and that becomes its own very powerful political force. Okay, so this is, she's already there. Uh, this politici- 
politicization in turn has transformed the way we understand violence against women. As I just said, it becomes systemic now, right? For example, she writes, battering and rape, once seen as private family matters and aberrational, errant sexual aggression are now largely recognized as part of a broad scale system of domination that affects women as a class. And this is where Brown Miller's work becomes very relevant. She cites somebody else in this particular note before mentioning Brown Miller, uh, giving, given that Brown Miller's covered in, in the previous note. But this is Brown Miller's influence. Rape and battering were once seen as private family matters and aberrational that is errant sexual aggression that's in parentheses. But now they are largely recognized by who? By critical theorists, of course, as a part of a broad scale system of domination that affects women as a class. So now men as a class are perpetrating a, a battery and uh, rape against women as a class. It's not individual rapists or ba wife beaters or batterers assaulting, raping, whatever it is, uh, individual women. It is now a broad scale system of domination. So all men bear complicity and all women bear victimhood by sisterhood. This is the, she's laying out her thought processes here, right? So this is, again, this politiz politicization has in turn transformed the way we understand violence against women. So violence against women is now to be thought of as a system from one class, namely men, to another class, women, where there's some complicity, rape culture, if you will, or patriarchy, or a system of misogyny and sexism that is oppressing some other group of people who are all in some kind of oppressed victim class. And that this kind of thinking is important, she says, because it allows the strength of shared experience and through the voices of millions to speak more powerfully than the pleas of a few isolated voices. So if you can get a lot of women to believe that they are all victims of rape, even if most of them have never been raped, they can speak in solidarity on that behalf or on behalf of that issue. And it's much louder than if only the ones who are victims and willing to speak up ever speak up. And if you can attack men as a class, um, then you can also get lots of men to speak up alongside you because you can catch them in guilt of their complicity for something they've never done because maybe they made uncomfortable locker room jokes, or maybe, uh, you know, they have the male gaze. They, they check out chicks like, like virtually every man does. Um, just like women check out dudes, or if they're gay, they check out the same sex, whatever people check out people they're sexually attracted to. This isn't really news, but the point being that this group based dynamic has been now started. This is the very first paragraph of the paper has is, is laid down as the fundamental foundation of Crenshaw's thought process. And it's key to intersectionality because intersectionality does not allow for individuals. The individual is the combination of the social classes or gr social groups, identity groups that you belong to and how those interact with one another to produce a uh, kind of system of oppression or matrix, they call it, of domination, uh, where you fit in it, which is called your positionality with regard to the systems, intersecting systems of power in society. And you are an avatar or a diplomat or something like that of that group rather than an individual person um, by virtue of the fact that you must if you are black, have the the black experience. And if you are white, you must have the white experience. And if you are a male, you must have a male experience. And if you are a female, you must have a female experience and so on. And that all these things are relevant. So this is how, this is the underlying set of assumptions being uncovered for Crenshaw's paper. She then goes on to say, this process of recognizing as social and systemic, what was formerly perceived as isolated and individual, has also characterized the identity politics of African Americans, other people of color, and gays and lesbians, among others. For all these groups, identity-based politics has been a source of strength, community, and intellectual development. Well, for the ones who buy in, right? Um, that word community is kind of the key here. I have a whole rant about community. Um, I should probably do another show about community on its own at, one po at some point, because uh, once you hear somebody calling out and saying, you know, the such and such, you know, the, 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 the computer gaming community, the gamer community, blah, 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 you can guarantee that person has ideas about what the moral code for that community is going to be. And they're going to appoint themselves kind of like the cops 
of the community. Well, I mean, community is a more complicated idea, but certainly this is only true for people who have buy-in. Everybody else in these categories, gays and lesbians who don't go along with queer politics, for example, African Americans and other people of colors who, in the words of Kanye West, think for themselves, are actually alienated by the identity politics being presented here. But this key, this is key here. The identity politics is what she's after, right? And so she's saying we're now moving to a group-based systemic line of thinking and away from isolated individualist thinking so that we can do identity politics in a way that unifies the voices of millions so that we're more effective, so we can act as political blocks instead of acting as individuals. That's her her objective with this. This is what she says is going on in the world. Now she's going to complain about it because it's critical. This is critical theory. It's what it does. It complains about everything. Here it's going to complain about itself. The embrace of identity politics, however, she says, has been in tension with dominant conceptions of social justice. Mm -hmm. Race, gender, and other identity categories are most often treated in mainstream liberal, liberal discourse as vestiges of bias or domination, that is, as intrinsically negative frameworks in which social power works to exclude or marginalize those who are different. According to this understanding, our liberatory objective should be to empty such categories of any social significance. Yet implicit in certain strands of feminist uh, racial liberation movements, for example, is the view that the social power in delineating differences need not be the power of domination. It can instead be the source of social empowerment and reconstruction. This is one hell of a paragraph, and there is a lot going on here that if you're not savvy to critical theory and how it thinks and what's going on, that you might miss. So we can start with identity politics. This is the idea. Where, did, where was the term identity politics? Where does that come from? That's like Martin Luther King, right? No, I did a I did a thing on that on my other podcast, my James Lindsay only subs. That no, in fact, the civil rights movement is not continued by this, and in fact, this paper is part of the evidence for that that I present. Identity politics is a term that was coined in 1977 in what's known as the Combahee River Collective, which was a group of queer black feminist socialists who wanted to do very very radical identity politics. They had erupted out of this kind of fusion of the radical feminism of the time in the 1970s. It was founded in 74. And the black liberationist, which most people would probably identify more along the lines of black power or black separatism or black nationalism, it's not quite the same. This black liberationist politics, a very radical black politics of the 70s, it came out of the late 60s. So, and, and like I said, they were socialists explicitly as it was a socialist group, the collective, right? The Combahee River Collective. And so this is where the term identity politics comes from. And it does not refer to what happened when Martin Luther King and his, well, I don't know that Martin Luther King ever did, but the people in Martin Luther King's movement in 1963 in Memphis were holding up signs that said, I am a man, not I am an identity category. I'm a man, uh, not I am black. I am a man. I'm like you. I'm not different. Stop treating me differently. That was what the civil rights movement was about. It was like breaking down identity. It was not identity politics in the sense of leaning into identity. And this is why she says that the embrace of identity politics has been in tension with dominant conceptions of social justice. Dominant conception of social justice at the time would have been quite liberal because those were the movements that were succeeding. Universal liberalism. I am a man. I'm not different than you. Treat me with respect. Live up to the uh, all men are created equal statement of the Declaration of Independence. Live up to the promises of things like the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act. Um, but this Crenshaw has different, something different in mind here. Very different. Her identity politics is very different. And she says, in fact, just to make it really explicit, let me just read this a little more of this paragraph again. Race, gender, and other identity categories are most often treated in mainstream liberal discourse. That's that's dominant conceptions of social justice, mainstream liberal discourse, as vestiges of bias or domination, not systems. Vestiges, not systems that are active and doing things right now. That is, she says, as intrinsically negative frameworks in which social power works to exclude or marginalize those who are, those who are different. According to this understanding, to get to the point, our liberatory objective should be to empty such categories of social significance. I am a man. Let's take the black part out. Morgan Freeman talking to Mike Wallace, you know, how are we going to end racism? Mike Wallace asks in their debate about, or their short debate about Black History Month. And Morgan Freeman says, stop talking about it. I'm going to call you Mike Wallace. 
you're going to call me Morgan Freeman. You're not going to call me a black man, and I'm not going to call you a white man. You know, empty the these categories of social significance. And this is a drum that I beat a lot. That that racism starts by putting social significance in racial categories, and so my mainstream liberal discourse about this issue is that we should try to take as much out as much social significance out of those categories as possible. Crenshaw is saying that that is in tension with identity politics. And the reason you hear that word liberatory objective, liberals don't usually talk about a liberatory objective. They talk about achieving equality. They talk about achieving fairness. They talk about achieving a lot of things. Liberatory is actually the fact that Crenshaw would use this word is a nod to the fact that she, her, her mental tradition that led up to this intellectual tradition that led up to this comes out of that Combahee River Collective, which was black feminists, which is the fusion again of radical feminist feminism with black liberationism that was particularly done by uh, with a bent toward queer politics because they were uh, lesbians and queer activists and it was also socialist liberatory here is liberation liberationism is another name for kind of middle stage critical theory or late stage critical theory where the goal is to have liberation from capitalist systems liberation from the oppressions all the intersecting oppressions of the, the, all the different systems of power and dominance that prevent an ideal, I, aka communist democracy, as they refer to it. That's what she's nodding to by mentioning that word in all likelihood. But her point here was that identity politics exists in tension with the idea that we would empty identity categories of social significance. In other words, for her, emptying social significance out of identity categories is a bad thing. Um, and she's criticizing the liberal approaches to social justice. So this is marking a dramatic turn in civil rights and liberalism in the progression of kind of the American experiment in line with its original liberal roots to something completely new, different, radical, and turns out neo-Marxist, liberationist, that is, and um, as we'll see at the end of the paper, postmodern as well, so woke. This is the paper where woke is really born. So she uh, goes on again to point out liberation movements, right? She says, yet yeah, implicit in certain strands of feminist and racial liberation movements, for example, is the view that the social power and delineating difference need not be the power of domination. So we can bring up difference without it being about racism, as most people think of it, is about domination. It can instead, she writes, be the source of social empowerment and reconstruction. So we're going to lean into identity categories, Crenshaw is saying from the get-go, in order we're going to we're going to put social significance into racial categories, but this time we're going to do it right. We're not going to recreate racism, we're going to create liberation by doing so. That's her argument. That's what she has in mind here. And she says, the problem with identity politics is not that it fails to transcend difference, as some critics charge, but rather the opposite. That it frequently conflates or ignores intra-group differences. Okay, so here's where intersectionality becomes important to the paper. Her problem with putting social significance into racial categories in order to do politics, aka identity politics, the Combahee River Collective's mindset, it's not that it fails to transcend difference. In other words, it's not that it brings difference back onto the table where we're now, I can't see Morgan Freeman as Morgan Freeman. I have to see him as a black man named Morgan Freeman. And I can't see Mike Wallace as Mike Wallace. I have to see him as a white man named Mike Wallace. That's not actually the problem, she says. It's the opposite. It's that identity politics isn't granular enough. It ignores intra-group differences. In other words, what she's going to make the case for is that black women in specific, this is intersectionality talking, are ignored by white radical feminism and they are ignored by uh, black male black liberationism. That's the whole point of this paper. And so what's going on here is she's turning these critical movements, radical feminism and black liberationism, on themselves. She's accusing white, she's accusing, I should say, radical feminism of being too white and therefore racist. She's accusing black liberationism of being too male and therefore being sexist. And they're black women. Not only are those problems therefore present in those movements, but then black women get doubly excluded. That's what the point of mapping the margins is. The margins that she's talking about, that she's mapping, are the margins of black liberationism, where you find black women, and the margins of radical feminism, where you find black women. 
So her problem with identity politics isn't that it brings identity to the table, which is an obvious problem with it, but she doesn't want to talk about that problem. She's going to say, no, no, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that if we get to an even more specialized identity group, that group's not being treated enough as a special interest. That's what her argument is about, is creating like a super special interest group, which is why intersectionality does. Uh, or why it does that is because it looks to create the greater special interest group. And her, the argument about intersectionality is that if you are in one of these, say, doubly marginalized or doubly oppressed categories, you're in two of them at once, not only do you have the all, all the problems of the one and all the problems of the other, but you also have unique problems all of your own. So you have this multiplicity of new problems that gives you so much more standing in the standpoint of epistemology that positionality under intersectionality was going to bring into the world. In other words, you get a lot more say and the ability to shut other people up and a lot more reason to be taken seriously, even when you're just spouting off at the mouth in your lived experience, which is then the shared experience of millions of people who have to lean into you through solidarity, which is what she said in the previous paragraphs. She says more specifically here, in the context of violence against women, this elision of difference in identity politics is problematic. Fundamentally, because the violence that many women experience is often shaped by other dimensions of their identity, such as race and class. So what she's trying to, what she does throughout most of the papers point out that if you have battered women, um, essentially rich white women or rich or white women uh, do better than poor and black women or poor or black women. Uh, and honestly, much of the paper makes a very weak case that race is the relevant variable and it is a very good case of making clear that class is a relevant variable which is kind of obvious if you have more resources you have more resources that's true no matter what and uh the only fix for that of course is some kind of communism thing so what you have now is race getting glommed on to class which is what you typically see in almost all of the woke literature it turns class issues into race issues by by doing a bad job of understanding statistics saying well more people of certain racial groups are um poor and there are probably reasons for that that are ultimately rooted in racism which whether that has anything to do with present racism or not is a, sometimes an open question sometimes it's uh, not happening. Sometimes it probably is happening. Um, but there's no real depth of analysis there. There is, oh, you know, racism is obviously a very relevant factor. It is the ordinary state of affairs in society. You have more poor people of certain racial groups than, uh, proportionately than in others. Therefore, it must be the case that racism is relevant. This is a typical Marxist argument, in fact, that, you know, that, that capitalism exploits racial minorities, exploits women, etc. So she goes on, moreover, ignoring, ignoring difference within groups contributes to tension among groups. Another problem of identity politics that bears on efforts to politicize violence against women. Feminist efforts to politicize experiences of women and anti-racist efforts to politicize experiences of people of color have frequently proceeded as though the issues and experiences they each detail occur on mutually exclusive terrains. Although racism and sexism readily intersect in the lives of real people, they seldom do in feminist and anti-racist practices. And so when the practices expound identity as a woman or as person of color as an either-or proposition, they relegate the identity of women of color to a location that resists telling. That's what I just said a moment ago. So her argument is that basically feminism cares about women as a class and it doesn't consider black women or women of color to be as important within that class. And so their special, special interest category, uh, issues um, are sidelined or even silenced. And then again, as racial liberation issues, uh, movements... Um, see women as less important through patriarchy and misogyny than just, you know, saying something like black or people of color overall, women again get marginalized. So the margins of radical feminism, the margins of black liberationism are ra queer, radical, black feminist, socialist women. And that's what she's making. And she says the identity of women of color is pushed to a location, a social position, positionality, as we now say, that resists telling. And the logic, of course, under this, if we want to call it applied postmodernism or wokeness or whatever we want to call it, the logic is that the more it resists telling, the more it needs telling, and the more true the telling probably is. Um, so uh, this is, 
you, we now have kind of the framework for where she's coming from, where she's going. So then she it says that by saying, my objective in this article is to advance the telling of that location, that social position, if you will, by exploring the race and gender dimensions of violence against women of color. And there's a footnote here. I'll just dip in for a second. She writes, this article arises out of and is inspired by two emerging scholarly discourses. The first is critical race theory. So if anybody ever says, you know, is it, if anybody ever says, is critical race theory always an intersectionality? The answer is yes. Uh, the author of both is saying so right here. She says, for a cross section of what is now a substantial body of literature, See, lots of things. She first cites, though, Patricia Williams, The Alchemy of Race and Rights, um, and goes on and on and cites several other people. But I want to bring up, uh, point out for just a moment, The Alchemy of Race and Rights. Sooner or later, I will get around to talking about Hegel for you. Stay tuned. Hegel was an alchemist. Many of these left-wing, ultimately Hegelian, dialectical, uh, critical processes are all about alchemy and the alchemy of race and rights is no huge exception. So this is a slight nod in that direction. Um, let me see. I want to skip past all of the uh, many, many recommended citations she has and get to the second one. The second, she says, less is a, a second less formally linked body of legal scholarship investigates the connections between race and gender and again gives many uh, examples this work in turn has, in, has been informed by a broader literature examining the interactions of race and gender in other contexts and cites lots of interesting characters. Patricia Hill Collins from Black Feminist Thought, um, which is a big, very famous book that's the black feminist tradition. Angela Davis, Women, Race, and Class. Well, who's Angela Davis? Herbert Marcuse's student. Um, so there's the direct link to very radical critical theory. Bell Hooks, Ain't I a Woman? Bell Hooks, I think actually Crenshaw borrowed a lot from Bell Hooks, a lot more than she's letting on, um, just mentioning here. And then, you know, several other figures. Uh, i tried to see quickly. I haven't read this in detail. Uh, if there are any others that really stick out. Um, no, there's some really big ones. Over. Angela Davis's name here is a significant thing that shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, certainly shouldn't be overlooked. Neither should Bell Hooks. Uh, Angela Davis, though, like I said, student of Herbert Marcuse. So that's a direct link from the repressive tolerance, hardcore critical theory that they laid out. Very radical activism, including literal violence and going to jail for it uh, on the part of Angela Davis. Um, ties into the Palestinian BDS movement with Angela Davis. Um, that's a it's in support for Jim Jones. There's lots of stuff going on with Angela Davis. And so this was a major influence on Kimberly Crenshaw as cited in this paper. So it's just good to point that out. Um, she says, contemporary feminist and anti-racist discourses have failed to consider the intersectional identities such as women of color. Um Focusing on two dimensions of male violence against women, battering, and rape, I consider how the experiences of women of color are frequently the product of intersecting patterns of racism and sexism. Now, these experiences tend not to be represented within the discourses of either feminism or anti-racism. So this is where she's problematizing, she says feminism and anti-racism, but what she means is, is uh, radical feminism and primarily, and although she probably, she has, she has words for all of feminism, liberalism and to. Uh, but in, in anti-racism, she's particularly talking about black liberationism. So she's turning those two radical movements on each other. Uh, because of their intersectional identity as both women and of color within discourses that are shaped to respond to one or the other, women of color are marginalized within both. So there's your mar margins that she's mapping out. That's the title of the paper. In an earlier article, it's one from two years earlier, I use the concept of intersectionality to denote the various ways in which race and gender inter, uh, race and gender interact to shape the multiple dimensions of capital B black women's employment experiences. A uh, quick summary of that paper, she brings up, for example, a, a discrimination case at GM and a couple of other uh, similar cases where it's alleged that black women are specifically uh, discriminated against 
but it's not detectable because there are plenty of black people working there, but there are black men who work on the factory floor, plenty of women who work there who are white women who work in the offices, but virtually no black women. And she claims with, I think, some credibility behind the the legal idea that there is a place in discrimination law where we have to be a bit more careful, um, while at the same time then taking the, the issue of intersectionality in a direction that's leading to where this paper comes from so that we've been discussing so far and it's going. Uh, she said, my objective there was to illustrate that many of the experiences black women face are not subsumed within the traditional boundaries of race and gender discrimination as those boundaries are currently understood and that the intersection of racism and sexism factors into black women's lives in ways that cannot be captured wholly by looking at the race or gender, gender dimensions of those experiences separately. And I say she has some she has a point that she's raising that's fair. And I don't know what the I'm not a legal scholar. I don't try to pretend to be one. I don't know what the right answer to identifying that point is. But I also know that the way that she decided to do it by leaning into postmodernism and critical theory is not the best way to deal with the issue. So she took it the wrong direction and started manufacturing an intersectionality that which we recognize now as applied postmodernism or wokeism. And uh this is really, like I said, the, the birthplace of that. Uh, just to point out, she, she, she cited Patricia Collins' Black Feminist Thought, and, black, and in Black Feminist Thought, um, Collins elaborates on a number of stereotypes also that are suffered specifically by black women that are not suffered by white women or by black men. So the idea that there are unique prejudices against um, intersecting categories, I would argue, is also one that has some validity to it. Uh, and needs to be considered. But again, I don't think that the, the critical theory approach or the postmodern approach certainly are going to be the best way to deal with that. Um, Crenshaw writes, I build on those observations here by exploring the various ways in which race and gender intersect in shaping structural, political, and representation, representational aspects of violence against women of color. So structural, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, so that's where we're going to be thinking in those systems we just talked about. Uh, but this is an important place to take a um, diversion into the footnotes again because she says, I explicitly adopt a black feminist stance in the survey of violence against women of color. Um, so when I say that, when, when we say black feminist here, black feminism is a specific ideology. I'm not talking about feminists that happen to be black. Uh, it's a very different thing. Um, to read the rest or some more of the footnote, maybe the rest of the footnote, she says, I do this cognizant of several tensions that such a position entails. The most significant one stems from the criticism that white, by the way, white is not capitalized while black is. Oh, sorry, this is white feminist. It doesn't say white, it says while. Again, my apologies, but she doesn't capitalize white. She does capitalize black throughout. Um, tiny print. So uh, the most significant one stems from the criticism that while feminism purports to speak for women of color through its invocation of the term woman, the feminist perspective excludes women of color because it is based upon the experiences and interests of a certain subset of women, meaning white and I guess white adjacent women, we have to say now. On the other hand, when white, and there's white, and it is not capitalized, feminists attempt to include other women, they often add our experiences into an otherwise unaltered framework. In other words, they don't make accommodations for the unique black woman experience. They just say, okay, you're, you're doing feminism with us. You're a woman too. Sisterhood. So she says, it's important to name the perspective from which one constructs her analysis. And for me, that is as a capital B black feminist. Again, that's a specific ideology rooted in the Combahee River Collective, which was more specifically queer black feminist socialist. And capital B black feminism is a ultimately neo-Marxist position taken up by radical black liberationist women who are also radical feminists. It's important to understand everything that's packed into that idea. Um, moreover, she says it is important to acknowledge that the materials that I incorporate in my analysis are drawn heavily from research on black women. On the other hand, I see my own work as a part of a broader collective effort among feminists of color to expand feminism to include analyses of race and other factors such as class, sexuality, and age. So definitely intersectional. But I want to highlight for just a second among feminists of color for you. 
right? Because she says she's a black feminist, and then she says feminist of color. That's what I'm talking about. Black feminism is an ideology, right? It is a specific perspective. Feminism, feminists of color is a broader category of things. Um, she says, I have attempted, therefore, to offer my sense of the tentative connections between my analysis of the intersectional experiences of black women and the intersectional experiences of other women of color. I stress that this analysis is not intended to include falsely or exclude unnecessarily other women of color. Okay. So she is explicitly coming from this black feminist perspective, which is, again, the, the fusion. It is radical feminists who are also black liberationists, who are primarily black women. Um, it's a very specific ideology. It's not just feminism practiced by a woman of color, because that would be feminism feminists of colors who, who she's describing that way. And it, it's a very specific line of thought. So I just want to make that clear, because when we were writing cynical theories, we had a lot of pushback uh, on an early draft because you see, people were telling us, you can't just say black feminism. That you, That's kind of offensive. That's what happens when you submit it to uh, leftist readers. Um, it's not offensive. It is the name of an ideology. Uh, so I just want to make that really clear for people. Um, next paragraph, Crenshaw continues, I should say at the outset, and this is a, we're going to get into a key footnote here. Uh, I should say at the outset that intersectionality is not being offered here as some new totalizing theory of identity. <laughs> well, okay. A uh, little context on that sentence. First of all, what happened? Yes, it, it definitely is a new totalizing theory of identity. So iron law of woke projection is happening here. Um, but I don't think, I don't know if Crenshaw actually intended for intersectionality to become that. She said it was a practice. She said that very often early on and still says it to this day, you know, 30 years later. Um, She's also said that intersectionality memed and it got away from its original commitments and it expanded beyond what she had intended and some of it's kind of an issue, but she actually continues to push intersectionality uh, unreservedly nonetheless. And it certainly has become a new totalizing theory of identity. And I want to elaborate before I get to the footnote because this is very important. I told you a moment ago that what intersectionality did was it problematized radical feminism as being racist and got all of these people whose operating system is problematized, critical theory, problematized, problematized, problematized. It got all of them to turn the critical lens back on themselves and to problematize themselves for their hidden racism in their activism. Then it did the same thing, I think to less effect, honestly, uh, in the black liberation movement and said, you guys aren't feminist enough. And I don't think that the black men actually cared that much. There's a lot of pushback against it. Um, there was a lot of pushback against it more within the black liberationist movement than there was within the uh, radical feminist movement. And radical, white radical feminists, of course, are, and so are the descendants of radical feminists. They're no longer radical. They're now uh, intersectional feminists. White intersectional feminists are obviously you know, some of the biggest drivers of what's going on. And it's because this paper, which allegedly is not being offered as some new totalizing theory of identity to quote her, uh, this paper made them problematize themselves and literally, in my opinion, drove them insane. They were already radical. They were already feminists and, and pushing on a kind of, you know, patriarchy, 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 you know, misogyny everywhere. Every it's a total rape culture. That's where we started with this paper. They were already there. And then it turned them completely nuts by saying, oh yeah, you're racist too. And these people had like a meltdown. And so because of that effect, this was able to spread like wildfire through activist groups, especially feminist activist groups, um, who now had to become more and more intersectional. And, and the need to become more and more intersectional so that they could absolve themselves of their feelings of racism or of homophobia or whatever else it was and all the different intersectional categories, ableism, fat phobia, it can go on down the list. Um, they adopted intersectionality overwhelmingly rapidly. It's like the, the, the mutation of white guilt into all the forms of guilt rapidly pointed inward and created this massive honestly, kind of like psychosocial complex. And this is where this, this is where it happened. Um, this paper right here is, I mean, it was in the water at the time, but this paper right here is really kind of where it happened. Um, so just to make that clear, the intersectionality took over because it was problematizing people who think in terms of problematization, which is why you can't problematize critical theory out of existence. Critical theory absorbs problematizing. If you say, oh yeah, you hurt this group or whatever, it can turn around and just absorb that and turn it around into more strength for itself. It doesn't work. Um, 
you have to do something different, which is to point out what's really going on and demand things like evidence that it can't produce because it's all just sophistry and bad arguments uh, and rhetoric. So she says it's not supposed to be some new totalizing theory of identity where everybody has to engage their positionality constantly and members of more privileged groups have to always use their privilege on behalf of members of less privileged or more oppressed groups, as Robin D'Angelo puts it in uh, Is Everyone Really Equal? Very, very, very explicitly. So Crenshaw lost control of that. She says, nor do I mean to suggest that the violence against women of color or that violence against women of color can be explained only through the specific frameworks of race and gender considered here. Now, this is not a particularly um, powerful sentence, but there's a footnote, number nine, footnote nine. And this is an important footnote. This is one of the most important footnotes uh, in this paper. This is, in fact, the... This is the forging of the one ring. You know, I'll try to do the poem again. One ring to rule them all, one ring to bind them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. Is that what it is? Find them all, bring them all. Anyway, solidarity is how they're going to be bound. They're going to be brought together in the darkness of identity politics where we put racial significance or social significance into racial and other identity categories. And this footnote number nine is where it happens. Footnote number nine in this paper near the end of its introduction is the birthplace of woke. It is the forging of the one ring. So you've got the nine rings that are given to the radical feminists doomed to die, the seven rings for the uh, black liberationists in their halls of stone, you know, the whole thing, right? And the three rings for the elven lords. I don't know what the, who the elves are right now. I don't want to get too into the Tolkien thing. But the point is that you've got this idea that critical theory becomes a tool of power and they've, it's been given to the feminists, it's been given to the black liberationists, and now we're going to bring it together and bind it together in the darkness, uh, in Mordor where the shadows lie, um, through making identity politics intersectional. And footnote number nine is where that happens. And this is the birthplace. This first sentence in particular of this footnote is the birthplace of wokeness. It's not the first time it was called wokeness. That was That, that had to wait till probably 2008, uh, or maybe even 2013, somewhere in that range. Erica Badu is the one who wrote a song, Master Teacher, that says, stay woke, stay woke, stay woke. And that's where the term really entered popular consciousness. And then um, 2013, the movement really kind of came together after Trayvon Martin was shot. And the Black Lives Matter was coming into existence before it got co-opted by exactly these people that uh, Crenshaw was informing um, and became a very radical, trained Marxist, as it were, organization. So here's what, here's the birthplace of woke. Footnote nine, first sentence. I consider, I, I tried to get all dramatic and then I said the word stupidly. I consider intersectionality a provisional concept linking contemporary politics with postmodern theory. Doesn't sound like there's a lot there, but it turns out that's an important sentence. I said that's the birthplace of woke. That's where it's all been bound. Uh, the paper, I guess, is where it's all been bound. But that sentence is the birthplace of wokeness, of applied postmodernism, as we call it in cynical theories. I consider intersectionality a provisional concept. Okay, so she's going to explain what she thinks intersectionality is. Linking contemporary politics, but by that, what does she mean? She means those radical politics that she's been talking about all along. Black liberationism, radical feminism, the uh, queer um, activist movement. It's not even the same thing as gay pride. It's not the same thing as the LGBT, LGB really at that point movement. Um, certainly not. This is a radical identity politics. This is neo-Marxism. Okay, she's talking about neo-Marxist radical movements with postmodern theory. So when Jordan Peterson called it postmodern neo-Marxism, this is what he's referring to. This is why he's not wrong. Mea culpa, I know, had a thing. Um, I don't want to throw Helen under the bus, but also I'll say I had a thing. Um, but Crenshaw lays it out here explicitly. She could literally write in the sentence instead in a slightly different parlance, Jordan Peterson's parlance, I consider intersectionality a provisional concept creating postmodern neo-Marxism. We're now going to link postmodern theory to neo-Marxist contemporary radical politics, identity politics in particular. 
she then carries on. So that is that that sentence. There's the birthplace of woke right there. If you didn't know where it is, that's where it is. Um, it was in the water. It was happening anyway. But that sentence cements it. Um, footnote number nine in the introduction of mapping the margins by Kimberly Crenshaw, 1991. She then says in mapping the intersection of race and gender, the concept does engage dominant assumptions that race and gender are essentially separate categories. By tracing the categories to their intersections, I hope to suggest a methodology that will ultimately disrupt the tendencies to see race and gender as exclusive or separable. So this is where the rings are being bound. This is an in the darkness bind them. This is, you know, however it's Ash, Nakanazil, or whatever it is in the language of Mordor. That's This is her saying that. By tracing the categories to their intersections, this is one ring, this is in the darkness bind them. I hope to suggest a methodology that will ultimately disrupt the tendencies to see race and gender as exclusive or separable and in the darkness bind them. I'm telling you, this is a, this is it. This is the forging of the one ring right there. Um, to continue, she writes, while the primary intersections that I explore here are, sorry, it splits pages between race and gender, the concept can be, uh, can and should be expanded by factoring in issues such as class, sexual orientation, age, and color. So, you know, however many rings go, you have a ring to all of these identity categories or the different kinds of feminism. You have the nine rings to the feminists and the queer theorists or whatever, and you have the seven rings to the race theorists and the whatever else, the disabled, I don't know, disability studies people, the fat studies. And now we're going to bring them together. We're going to bind them under a single theoretical framework that is a provisional concept linking neo-Marxism to postmodernism. So this is this is it. This is the forging of the one ring. This is the birthplace of wokeness. Uh, undeniable in the introduction to Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins. So picking up from there, she says, Indeed, factors I address only in part or not at all, such as class or sexuality, are often as critical in shaping the experiences of women of color. That's what I just said a minute ago. Usually, what in fact, sexuality, fine, that's whatever, but class class. Uh, I'm going to address this in part or not at all. Yeah, that's right. Because you're going to take class and you're going to sweep it into women or you're going to sweep it into race and you're going to bolster your argument uh, by a poor understanding of the relevance of class by conflating it with either race or sex or both. Uh, because you know, they are critical to the shaping of it, the experiences of women of color, as she says. My focus, she writes, on the intersection of race and gender only highlights the need to account for them for multiple grounds of identity when considering how the social world is constructed. Here she cites uh, Mari Matsuda. This is kind of an important little footnote. She says, um, Professor Mari Matsuda calls this inquiry asking the other question, uh, gives a citation. Um, for example, she writes, we should look at, uh, again, the text is tiny, I'm trying. We should look at an issue or condition traditionally regarded as a gender issue and ask, where is the racism in this? Mm hmm. There's the other question. Okay, so asking the other question means you've got to bring another factor of identity into this. We're going to have to engage positionality intentionally. These phrases that have become more common in the past 10 years that we were all starting to hear out in the everyday lexicon at your HR department or from your kids coming home from school uh, or your college student that you sent off that came home as a as, as a little fascist. Um, these kind of phrases are born here. Uh, so she calls this inquiry asking the other question. Okay, so if we're going to talk about gender, you better ask about race. If we're going to talk about race, you better ask about gender. If you're going to talk about either one, you better ask about uh, sexuality. You bring in sexuality, somebody better be asking about ableism, and I, I don't know how fat phobia fell out of this, and on and on it goes. Okay? That's, that's the mentality here. This is the mentality of problematizing whatever you're doing to further concentrate the theory and create that totalizing theory of identity that she said she wasn't intending to make. But this is really something, right? So this is 1991. Robin D'Angelo wrote her first major paper, not her first paper, but White Fragility in, in 2011. And it was in 2012, the first time that I've seen the now infamous 
the question is not did racism take place, but how did ra- racism manifest in this situation, uh, which I say goes back to one of the very earliest assumptions of critical race theory, which is that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society. This is actually quoting from Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk in uh, Critical Race Theory and Introduction. The question is not, sorry, I went to, the, I went to D'Angelo, which is also a quote, um, but racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society, not an aberration. Uh, or racism is the ordinary, not aberrational state of affairs in society. It's normal science, as it were. Um, that's what they say about it, racism. And so here we have Mari Matsuda being cited from 1991 in a paper written in 1991. For example, we should look at uh, an issue or condition traditionally regarded as a gender issue and ask, where is the racism in this? Because, of course, it must be there. Because it's not, did racism take place, but how did racism manifest in the situation. So we look at a, a gender issue and we should ask, where is the racism in this? And of course, if we look at a race issue, we should ask, where is the sexism? Where is the uh, gender exclusion? Where is the fat phobia, et cetera, in this? Asking the other questions. So um, really this is, you know, bringing all of the identity groups together and trying to cobble them together in a solidarity-based movement that really came out of queer black feminist socialism in the Combahee River Collective, citing people like Angela Davis, borrowing off of the Combahee Collective, uh, River Collective, um, dipping into explicitly into critical race theory, into black liberationism. So that's going to be where all the ante gets kicked up to. But we should always ask the other question. Uh, We should always problematize ourselves, which psychologically ends up having an effect that builds a lot through the, the, the generalization of white guilt, builds a lot of commitment to the cause because you realize that you have all this cult dynamics of wokeness. You realize all of this vulnerability within yourself, And then the next thing you know, because you feel that vulnerability, the doctrine provides you with the solution that makes you resolve the dissonance and discomfort you feel from your vulnerability and your guilt. In this case, that is solidarity. And the solidarity points in a particular direction, which in this paper is obviously black women, because yeah, I'll nod in the directions of others, but that's really where it's at. And then if we have to add one thing, we'll bring up sexuality. So queer black women in particular uh, end up being the ones at the top of the new intersectional hierarchy based on solidarity and presented through uh, the the word equity. Equity will pay queer black women primarily. And so to finish up the last paragraph of the introduction, we've hit the most important part already, which was that footnote where where intersectionality is revealed to be the the design of the one ring or the, the origin of wokeness. Uh, But the last paragraph, she writes, I have divided the issues presented in this article into three categories. In part one, I discuss structural intersectionality, the ways in which the location of women of color at the intersection of race and gender makes our actual experiences of domestic violence, rape, and remedial reform qualitatively different from that of white women. I shift the focus in part two to political intersectionality, where I analyze how both feminist and anti-racist politics have paradoxically often helped to marginalize the issue of violence against women of color. Then in part three, I discuss representational intersectionality, by which I mean the cultural construction of women of color. So the postmodernism is undeniable here. We got structural issues going on, structuralism. That's going to actually be less structuralism in the in the French sense, so I shouldn't do that. That's going to be structural in the neo-Marxist sense um, that she's really coming from. And uh, then she talks about political intersectionality, which is actually... Uh, the, the look at policy, which becomes very interesting when we look at now Ibram Kendi, um, who who has taken out the word systems and replaced it with policy so that people won't know what he's talking about. He said something to that effect at one point. Uh, and then in part three, she goes into representational intersectionality, by which is this is the most postmodern one, um, by which I mean the cultural construction of women of color. And it's a very postmodern concept that women of color are a constructed category and that people who happen to be women of color are placed into that category uh, and therefore have kind of um, a culture within that uh, domain uh, or those discourses around that domain as well. So she then writes to wrap up the paragraph, I consider how controversies over the representation of women of color in popular culture can also elide the particular location of women of color and thus become yet another source of intersectional disempowerment. 
Finally, I address the implications of the intersectional approach within the broader scope of contemporary identity politics. That means that's in the conclusion, which we'll turn to next. I will skip all of the parts one, two, and three about structural, um, political, and representational intersectionality because they are fairly repetitive and tedious and very long. This paper, like I said, is 60 pages long. We are on page six to give you some concept. Actually, technically, the first page is like a cover sheet, so we're on page five, and no one really wants to read through 60 pages of this. Uh, it would take seven or eight uh, episodes. Uh, so we'll skip to the conclusion. What she's actually talking about there uh, when she says the implications of the intersectional approach within the broader scope of contemporary identity politics, what she's actually going to do is criticize liberalism and liberal so-called identity politics. I would contend that no such thing as liberal identity politics genuinely exists because um, identity politics came specifically out of a queer, black, feminist, socialist uh, collective. Um, but we'll grant the term will grant the term that there is a liberal identity politics, which is a liberal, universal liberal approach to caring about issues that do affect people of, uh, in identity categories. Um, and it tries to solve those problems by reducing the social significance of those categories. Uh, she criticizes that vigorously, and she criticizes actually postmodernism somewhat as well. Uh, probably because she's more of a critical theorist and then she redeems some of postmodernism. And that's what we'll turn to in part two of this um, abridged reading of Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins. Again, subtitle Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color from Stanford Law Review, 1991. Uh, so thank you for joining me for this first part, reading through Kimberly Crenshaw's most famous and most influential paper. And stay tuned for uh, part two, which should come out soon, and we'll detail the conclusion where we get more into our critiques of liberalism and postmodernism. And I will catch you then and there. <laughs>